All right, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Mark Gallarducci, the Governor Brown's Director of Emergency Services, and um, welcome to the uh, Earthquake Early Warning Advisory Board. Uh, this is the initial meeting of uh, this new advisory panel that um, was uh, put into a legislation statute this last year um, that provides us the um, governance structure for implementing California's earthquake early warning system. Um, so uh, I'll come back in a minute and touch base on a few topics, but first I'd like to turn it over to Tina Walker, who is our uh, program manager, who will um, do some of the housekeeping. Did you want to start with the roll? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. We're going to go ahead and call roll to begin with. Um, David Bunn for John Laird, Secretary, California Natural Resources Agency. Here. Diana S. Dooley, Secretary, California Health and Human Services Agency. Samantha Louie representing the Secretary. Thank you. Brian Kelly, Secretary, California Transportation A Agency, uh, designee Stephanie Dougherty. Good afternoon here. Thank you. Alexis Podesta, Secretary, California Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. She's here, yeah. Okay. Barry Anderson, Vice President, Emergency Preparedness and Response for PG&E. Good afternoon here. Thank you. Ann Cronenberg, Executive Director, San Francisco Department of Emergency Management. Uh, thank you. I'm here. Thank you. Janet Napolitano, President, University of California, designee Gary Leonard. Present. Thank you. Thank you. And Tim White, Chancellor, California State University, designee Tom Kennedy. Tom Kennedy here, representing California State University. Thank you, Tom. Okay, before we begin, I'd like to let the board know and our audience that we are streaming live today. The video will be archived and available for viewing to um, all participants following the meeting. Um, be, I understand that with the video that gestures may or may not be seen by our viewing audience. We're also audio recording for minutes taking purposes. That will not be archived or available following the meeting. Um, also, um, we've all had an opportunity, I believe, to review the agenda. Uh, I'd like to go over that briefly. Um, we will have uh, Tina Curry of Cal OES and Doug Given doing a presentation on the history of earthquake early warning in California. And we'll also have an update from Ryan Arba. He is our branch chief for earthquake tsunami volcano program at Cal OES. Um, and then item four, we'll have a vision uh, for moving forward from uh, Deputy Director Tina Curry as well. And we will take public comment following that. I'd like to move to adopt the agenda. So moved. Thank you. Second? Second. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you, Tina. Um, so before I, I uh, ask uh, Tina Curry to come up and kind of give us a little bit of a history, um, first of all, let me thank all of you um, uh, and uh, for your um, engagement and for mem many uh, uh, many uh, individuals in the audience this has really been a collaborative concerted effort to establish this governance structure um, uh, without stealing too much of Tina's thunder there's been a lot of work that has been done over the years in California related to uh, earthquake um, assessments earthquake shaking earthquake warning and um, really what this does is it's, you know, the, the, whole, the whole saying that, you know, your time will come. And in this case, the time has come to be able to pull all of this great work that has been done, um, all of this capability that has been established, and put it into a way that we can build a reliable, sustainable, and collaborative warning system that the public can count on. Um, that our, our, our various public critical infrastructures, um, the various lines of business or health or telecommunications or transportation can count on um, to be able to react with some assurity, some high level of reliability that those, re those reaction actions um, will be the right things to do and will Ultimately, while we know this is a life-saving uh, capability that we will be implementing, 
um, is also a massive hazard mitigation <clears throat> effort for California by buying down the risks that um, that that will that come with strong ground shaking and earthquakes. And we've learned from our partners, um, our colleagues in Japan and in Mexico and other parts of the world that have also implemented similar systems. We learn what works for them and what doesn't, um, best practices, and, and we, we learn that California is, as I often say, the nation state of California, a large and complex geography with many demographics um, and very, very challenging topographies to be able to get uh, this system rolled out in, a, um, in an appropriate way that we can, again, uh, deliver a reliable message is really uh, where we're at. So I'm, I'm very uh, excited about today. This has been a long time coming. I I'm particularly want to thank uh, Senator Hill's office, and they were very helpful and, and instrumental in, in helping with the meeting logistics today, but also, uh, you know, originally Senator uh, Alex Padilla, now Secretary of State, initially um, putting legislation in for earthquake early warning, and then Senator Hill picking up on that and moving forward to establish this governance body. Um, now the big work uh, begins uh, with regards to taking all of our respective capabilities, and the board has been chosen because of your technical specific technical expertise uh, or the areas that you would represent um, in your particular industry area um, or possibly, uh, um, you know, specifically, you know, the, the, the technical expertise you bring to the table. And um, uh, my only ask of all of you is that you, you engage and we have a good dialogue and we, we work together to ensure that this new system um, gets implemented. Um, there has been funding. You'll know. You'll learn about that in a little bit. And there's. And you know, we haven't really waited since the legislation and the funding was made available um, by Governor Brown um, uh, last year. There was uh, ten million dollars made available f f as a sort of an um, jump start, so to speak. Um, we've done a lot with that, and um, we are working closely with our partners in the federal government at the United States Geologic Survey, and our partners in the academia. Um, Caltech and Berkeley and, and other universities to be able to um, build on the, the great work that they have, they have done. There have been some, has been some federal funding, um, and uh, as, as most government funding sources, as we all know, it, it is always subject to what's happening with the budget. So we're, we're, one of the challenges that we have in front of us is to continue to build this with some sustainable uh, funding streams so that you know, we've got a system that is operational in, in, in many years to come. Um, so with, with that, I, I would just, if I could, I would just like to um, uh, go around to the board members. If you could just, you know, uh, introduce yourself, kind of talk about the agency that you represent and, and some of the, the areas and give everybody sort of a sense of, uh, of, of who's on the advisory panel. We'll, we'll start with you. Good afternoon, uh, Stephanie Doherty. I'm the Deputy Secretary for Transportation Safety and Enforcement at the California State Transportation Agency. Uh, we collectively, under our agency umbrella, we have the California Highway Patrol, uh, Caltrans, Department of Motor Vehicles, Office of Traffic Safety, um, California Transportation Commission. So um, clearly departments that have a role in uh, infrastructure, public safety, um, emergency response and uh, will play a key role in coordinating in the event of, of an earthquake or other serious incident that would take use of this uh, or make use of this system. Thank you. Good, Good afternoon. Bunn. David Bunn. I'm Director of Department of Conservation here representing uh, Natural Resources Secretary John Laird. Um, the Department of Conservation uh, contains several divisions and uh, key ones relevant to this is uh, we have the California Geological Survey. That's directed by the state geologist John Parrish, who's here in the audience, and frankly, you know, the real expert in our our, our department on, on this topic. Um, we also, you know, maybe tangentially re relevant is we manage oil and gas and geothermal thermal resources. Uh, we also uh, uh, work with counties in managing mine reclamation and, uh, and other natural resources. Great. If we could just let the record reflect, the Secretary Podesta has arrived, and so. Secretary, we're just introducing ourselves and talk about your agency and what you oversee. Sure. Is it 
and that's my turn. Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Hi, okay, everyone. <laughs> um, so, thank you. So, my name is Alexis Podesta. I'm the Secretary of the Business Consumer Services and Housing Agency. We oversee nine departments, um, one of which is the Seismic Safety Commission, and that puts us um, uniquely positioned here where we interface with consumers on the rest of everything we do, plus we've got the commission that uh, we work with on a whole number of projects that many others here work on as well. I don't know how in-depth we're... That's good. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thanks for being here. Sure. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Samantha Louie. I'm an assistant secretary. I'm representing uh, Secretary Diana Dooley for the Health and Human Services Agency. Key departments and why we're really thrilled to be a part of this advisory committee are those that really impact the health and safety when we have emergency functions. So we have operations within the Department of Public Health as well as Emergency Medical Services Agency. A critical one that we are also going to monitor our overlap are the hospital security pieces. So with the Office of Statewide Health Care Planning and Development. Um, look forward to continuing our partnership with you. Great. Thank you. It's great. Very. Uh, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Barry Anderson. My day job is uh, running the distribution system for PG&E. I also have responsibilities for corporate-wide um, emergency management. Um, my role here is to represent the utility industry. We have a real vital role with first responders after an earthquake to secure the gas system and really get the lights back on. So that's my role, and um, I'm really looking forward to it. Thanks for being here, Barry. Yeah. Good afternoon. I'm Ann Cronenberg, Director of Emergency Management for the City and County of San Francisco. I'm honored to be on this board, and I want to thank Senator Hill and the whole Senate uh, for choosing me to represent the counties. I know it's going to be shifting between north and south, and so I take this responsibility very seriously. We know that there will be a major earthquake, 99% certainty in the next 30 years, and it's one of the things that keeps me awake in my job at night. Um, we do many things in emergency response. I sit on um, uh, FEMA's National Advisory Committee. I'm on the uh, Bay Ricks JPA. I chair the Bay Area UASI. So lots of different hats, but earthquakes are something that is very near and dear to my heart, and I'm very happy that this advisory uh, group has been formed, and thank you. Thanks, Ann. Great to have you here. Hi, Gary Thank Leonard. You. I'm uh, part of the Office of President, Office of Risk Services within the University of California. Uh, as many of you probably know, we have 10 campuses and five medical centers uh, throughout the state, uh, many in major urban areas. Um, we partner closely with the state partners and county partners uh, in preparedness for uh, natural disasters, earthquake uh, being the, the one that we're all concerned about. So um, we're happy to be part of this uh, uh, panel as well, and um, we also have the research aspect that um, our, our Berkeley colleagues are involved with. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Tom Kennedy. I'm Chief of Architecture and Engineering for the California State University System. We're a 23 campus system representing from San Diego to Humboldt and every location in between. We have a diverse uh, portfolio of buildings and a long history of uh, seismic experiences and involvement. Uh, we also have a seismic review board. This is an independent advisory board that has been established for some 25 years now. Helps us guide and manage and mitigate our risks and advise us on how to well position ourselves. Fantastic. So thank you all again. I, I think that, um, as you can see, we, we have um, uh, the, the panel that has been chosen really does represent a great cross the, the, the board spectrum and um, really we believe can add to us having this reliable system get get built and implemented in the in the near term future um, so with that then I would like to maybe move on to um, our first presenter and that's going to be I think Tina are you going to come up with Doug or are you just going to come up by yourself so Tina Curry is the Deputy Director of, uh, of OES and oversees uh, our Preparedness and Prevention Earthquake Programs, and Dr. Doug, Doug Givens from the United States Geologic Survey, and 
uh, one of the leading uh, folks from the USGS on the earthquake early warning. Tia, we'll start Great. with you. Thank you. Thanks for that introduction. Um, it's probably um, obvious is uh, under my portfolio is earthquake preparedness for um, Cal OES in the state of California, but really um, here um, with the representation of you all as, as the board and, and the people in the room, there's been a lot of collective effort towards develop, getting us to where we are today and an exciting initiative of earthquake early warning. And um, as part of the meeting materials that we sent out, we included like a little bit of a primer on, on earthquake early warning. Some of you have been um, certainly familiar with, with the mechanics of it. Doug does a way better job of explaining the technology, so he'll be doing that next. So I'm going to fast forward a little bit and then just cover through a few slides sort of, you know, a little bit brief, brief history of um, what got us here today and, and Cal OES's involvement and some of the actions that have been taken. Let's see, so I get to be the first one that figures out how to advance the slides. There we go. So what's been done in California, and I know Doug will get into this, is there is a what is now called a prototype system that's, that's in place in California, has been in place for some time, that's allowing this to be tested. So the technology is in use and it's out there and many, many users are getting to, um, getting to see what earthquake early warning will, will um, look like and, and, um, and what kind of... Um, um, you know, how basically the, it will be presented in, in advance of a major quake. There's also been legislation that, that California has, has put into place over the last few years. Um, back in 2013, I believe, was the first bill, SB 135, which established Cal OES as the lead organization working with um, many partners as it had been in the past. Um, you know, really memorializing that to make sure that this happens in California. You have copies of these in your materials. Um, the next uh, bill, I don't recall exactly the, the year, um, it might have been 2015, was SB 494, and that bill established the Earthquake Safety Fund. And why that's important and what we'll be talking about um, as we go through the meeting today is the financing of this. You know, it really, um, you know, we want to be thoughtful, we want to think long term. Um, we know how budgets work, we know how the economy works, how do we make sure that this is viable and sustainable in California? California for the long term, um, given the inevitable fluctuations, and again, as the director has said, the important mitigation um, that this technology, this this um, this capability, will provide us to really prevent losses, um, save lives, protect property, and help us recover quick, more quickly. You know, things we haven't been able to do before, um, and in with the condition, you know, with the environment of, of earthquakes as we've known them until now. And finally, SB 438 was signed in 2016, establishing you, the, the, the board, and, um, and uh, really kind of setting into motion some of the important um, governance aspects of this to include a business plan and some other very specific elements that will make sure that we have the tools that we need to see this through. And Ryan Arba, our earthquake program manager, will be going through that process a little bit more. A director mentioned in the 2016-17 state budget last year, $10 million of general fund was authorized. We'll be talking to you about how that's been um, invested so far. There's also an implementation framework so that's been written for California. We had a steering committee that preceded this board that was made up of um, many of the representatives that uh, state, federal, private universities that have been working on not only earthquake uh, readiness but also earthquake early warning to start putting together the roadmap for how we get there in California, what's been done, how do we bring this together, what needs to be done ahead. So you have that as, as really a foundational document that we hope that you will take and, and we'll, we'll move from that into the actions we need to, to uh, implement this system. And finally, um, another item that might be of interest to you is what we call a benefit study that was conducted um, the, just in this past year. And what we wanted to do was really is look at from the perspective of the ultimate users of the system, all the different industries you can imagine that you represent and that, and that are out there, including the public, exactly how do they see, based on what they know and what they've heard and what they've experimented with, so to speak, where do the benefits lie, what do we need to to examine in order to get there. So we have that available to you as well. And um, I'll talk a little bit in detail in the next slide about some of the results that came out of that. But um, again, it's looking at it from the, pr from the perspective of ultimately the users of the system, what they see some of the opportunities and challenges are for earthquake early warning. So here's a little bit of the contents, if you will, of that implementation framework I mentioned. So it it's, um, was developed by a steering committee that we had in place um, <coughs> as soon as that 
initial bill was signed, we wanted to get moving on establishing um, a forum for California to, to work on this together. Um, how it describes how the system will be rolled out for public use, building off the prototype that that's, um, continues to be in place. It will, talks about, and this is important, about how it's going to build upon something we currently have in California in terms of the technology, and, and Doug um, I, we'll describe this in more detail, I think, is um, we do have a, net, a seismic network in California, the California Integrated Seismic Network. It has been in place for years. It's been a partnership where um, different agencies bring together not only funding but, but expertise and, um, and uh, their personnel to run this network for us and provide real-time earthquake information so that we know the magnitude, the location of earthquakes in California. So, so fortunately, earthquake early warning can be built on the backbone of that system in terms of the technology. And finally, um, a framework that talks about the system, who will be responsible for what, how the public and private sector will work together, and ultimately an implementation, implementation strategy. So that's um, a document that we hope you become familiar with that um, I think provides some good, um, a good foundation for our work ahead. And Tina, that, those have a link for that. They've yes, given they a do. link to yeah. that so you, you can yeah. drive that. Okay. Thank you for that. And then the benefits study included interviews of representatives from 14 different sectors that we um, determined were really integral to help us paint a picture of where we are today and where we need to go. And the sectors that were represented in the study were organizations from the electric industry, telecommunication, mass transit, transportation, gas, water, hospitals, um, insurance, education, financial, information technology, and the industrial sector. So what you would imagine um, um, as users of this were consulted and asked some very specific questions and, and, and gave us some interesting results. And that study concluded that, um, maybe not really surprising, is that Pretty much across the board, it was agreed there's a, there's a significant life safety benefit to this, meaning if we can get this into the hands of people, whether they are workforce uh, members in, in, the, you know, in the line of work at the time, um, school children, you know, those of us just in society, if we can get that warning to them, they can definitely see there's, there's a benefit there um, if for that sort of mass distribution of the signal. Um, system standards are important. There needs to be some assurance that, that this system will perform when, it, when the time comes, that it was reliable and, um, and uh, to the best that we can that it's, it's going to provide accurate information because we are expecting that really important decisions, whether they be automated or human, are going to occur based on these warnings. So some, some, there's an expectation of reliability. That was something that really rose to the top from the respondents. It is um, viewed as a major public safety infrastructure project, and we need to approach it that way. Um, so I think, you know, um, your consult is, as you, with your expertise in infrastructure, I think will really help us do the right things and, um, and look out for the um, important elements of something similar to this. It's liability protections concern. You know, what happens when we get this warning? What does that mean in, in, in that arena? It um, should be viewed as, a, as something that's available to the public. Um, that's available to everyone, and the need for stable and consistent funding. So this really validated a lot of things that um, we expected or had, had experienced for those of us who have been working on this for a while, um, some working out a lot longer than me, but m most recently um, um, myself included, and the, some new things you know, that rose to the top that was very interesting. So this was um, good data for us to have, again, to carry out the work that we're going to do from here. So we just wanted to let you know that these things are available um, to help this board move forward. Now, this is probably impossible to read, so sorry about the eye chart here. But we wanted to let you know that as part of the governance legislation and also as part of our implementation framework, we created really what we thought would be the best organization. I mean, you know, this is, um, for lack of a better term, your, your workforce that's going to be putting this together and all the components therein. So there's you as the advisory board. There's the Callaway S earthquake program. You know, the staff that are members of that are all here. Um, we were able to get some new positions with the, with the budget allocation, so we're very grateful for that. The other agencies that you represent, Seismic Safety, Department of Conservation, that are already working in the earthquake space together as partners with us. Um, obviously, our federal partners, our universities, all, you know, bringing, bringing together all of that, um, that uh, 
earthquake, um, that great work that's been done in earthquake early warning and just earthquake preparedness in general uh, reflected in an in a organization structure for this particular endeavor. So a lot of what has been done that we're going to be talking about um, up to this point has been in what we call the system operations, building the network, getting the sensors in the ground, the, the things that have to absolutely be in place before we can make, make this available to the public has been a huge focus. Also, we have this integrated seismic network. We had that. It has its own governance structure already. We wanted to use, it was important to use as much as we already have, not reinvent the wheel and carry out earthquake early warning through that structure. And then there's some other areas that are equally important but maybe less developed that we want to, um, to you know, use this program, use this governance process to really get it developed as, as, much, as much as we can so that they can work together and really see through um, see us through implementation. Research and development, um, clearly something that's needed. We want to define that, make sure that we have the right participants, the right way to drive that, um, you know, through existing um, forums or, or um, new ones if we need them. Finance and investment, um, we'll be talking about that. And then education and training, um, which is a wide swath of things. Um, some of the obvious would be, you know, how do we coach the public and what to do when they get a warning. What does it mean? Um, you can imagine other warning systems that are in your lives now. Um, you know, we, people need to know what to do when they receive this. And the wording of that is critical. You know, all these things that have to be um, really in place and working correctly when those few seconds um, is, is what we'll get. Um, but also training itself. You know, what does it mean to use this? There's going to be um, um, uh, training that our 911 systems, our first responders, anybody who's going to be receiving this that's going to want to want or need to take an action, we have to think about that through what are their needs going to be, as well as with industry. You know, the utilities industry, just Barry's workforce out there in the field, you know, you're probably going to want, you know, very specific um, protocols in place for this. Um, you know, they there are as part of the benefit study, we, we, we heard loud and clear that there's people, you know, we're ready for earthquakes. We've prepared for these for a long time. Just about everybody who operates in California knows that this is a risk. And so we've set things up based on how we've found out about earthquakes in the past. You know, you either feel the shaking or you get the, the, the notification in real time. And so now it's not a matter of just turning that switch on 20 seconds earlier, there's very different type of actions that we would expect would happen with early warning. So the training of across the board. So that's a really big um, component that we're working to define better and, and put the right organization together. But, um, you know, that can't be emphasized enough, I think, that, that education component and how, how far and wide it spans. So that was really... I guess the end of my um, my presentation, um, kind of leading us up to sort of what got us here. I'll turn it over to Doug to talk about the, um, and you might want to do this yourself, um, just sort of the, the technical part and um, all the great work that, that USGS and, and their partners have been doing. Sure. Yeah, thank you, Tina. Um, First, I want to emphasize that I'm not from Washington, D.C. I'm a native Californian, born and raised. <laughs> My degrees are from your fine institutions. So uh, don't, uh, don't hate me for being from the federal government. But I am going to give the federal government perspective on, um, on this project. We've been at it for a while. I'm going to cheat. Uh, to try and keep the slide count down, I put like five slides worth of information on this one slide. Um, so in the sort of the center left there, you see a flow chart from left to right showing the five major components that are needed for a viable earthquake early warning capability. Uh, you need sensors in the field, and we've determined uh, how dense that sensor array needs to be. And you can see the map on the right showing um, the stations that are currently in the ground in the dark uh, spots. The green spots are those that are in the ground but need to be upgraded to contribute. And the yellow are the notional spots. So don't hold us to that. You can see they're in kind of a grid pattern. You go out into the field and you find out, oh, can't put it there. got to move it a, a bit. So, uh, But that's the approximate uh, distribution of stations that we're talking about. And as part of the federal perspective, our goal is to do a three-state system uh, to protect the entire West Coast. So California is obviously a critical part of that. Most of the uh, risk is concentrated in the state of California, but we can't ignore uh, the other states uh, because obviously the earthquakes don't respect our geographic boundaries. Um, and that includes uh, integration ultimately with Mexico to the south, and we're already working with the Canadians to the north. Um, the uh, 
sensor network data has to come into the central processing sites through field telemetry. Uh, that can be difficult to accomplish and expensive to operate over the long term. So the more we can ride other existing telecom systems, the better off we are. Uh, we are using multiple uh, technologies to do that. Uh, once it gets into the central processing sites, and those are shown as the yellow stars on the map, we have three major processing sites. We didn't build those from scratch. Those were the processing sites that already existed for the routine network monitoring, uh, earthquake monitoring uh, capabilities that we have. Uh, in the United States, there are many regional seismic networks. Uh, on the West Coast, there are basically three, Northern California, Southern California, and the Pacific Northwest. Uh, so those have been operating for quite a long time, and Cal OES has been financially supporting the operation of the California networks since 2001. Um, central processing, there's a lot that has to go on there. The data has to be collected. The scientific algorithms scan over the data, uh, determine that an earthquake is in, uh, has begun at its size, the potential impacts, determine whether or not an alert or a notification of some sort should go out. Um, and then, obviously, that alert has to be delivered. Now, you'll notice that the first two, sensor networks, field telemetry, and processing alert creation are in a darker blue, and that's because they fall squarely within the purview of the existing data processing operations networks. Once the alerts leave our door, they have to be delivered by other technologies that we don't own, that we don't control, that we have to foster, that we have to educate, that we have to encourage to build the capabilities that are necessary in order to deliver those alert fast enough and reliably enough to make the impacts that we hope they will. And then, of course, the last box is the user actions. And when you think about the uses of early warning, you must always think in at least two major categories. The first is people, and that's the one that usually comes to mind. What am I going to do? What are people I know going to do with an earthquake early warning message? <laughs> uh, like that? <laughs> and the uh, <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I actually am hoping it'll come through on my pager. But, um, the, uh, so two categories, people. Uh, but the other is things, uh, automatic systems, trains, elevators, factory lines, uh, and that's, uh, again, outside of our domain, we must encourage uh, the real users to uh, make the business case that, that that's something that is worthwhile for them to do, and also to encourage the development of industrial partners, companies who will make it their business to enable earthquake early warning activities to mitigate the hazard and loss of life and injuries in various settings. And that's actually uh, already going underway. Um, in the bottom center uh, is a timeline of the USGS-funded project. We began in uh, 2006. I won't go through it in excruciating detail. Uh, but we have made incremental progress along the way, both in developing the algorithms, setting up the computing infrastructure, and in building out stations. It's nowhere near complete, uh, but we are now at the point where we have what we call a full West Coast prototype running from Washington, Oregon, California, um, and producing alerts today. Uh, I'll say more about what, why we aren't done. Uh, well, you know the answer to that. We're not fully funded. Um, so that's one of the major issues. Um, quick primer on early warning. Uh, I think most people understand the concept. An earthquake is caused by slip on a fault. Uh, that slip on the fault generates elastic waves that travel through the crust of the earth. Um, the fastest moving of those waves is called a P wave, the primary wave. It is relatively small and typically doesn't do damage. It's followed by a slower but stronger wave, the S wave, secondary wave, a lot of imagination there in the scientists, primary and secondary. And there are some other waves that follow uh, after that. But um, some numbers there for the speed at which these waves move. And of course, what it is really behind early warning is if you can sense those waves, determine that the earthquake is big enough to be concerned about, you can send an alert at the speed of light, at the speed of information, and warn people to take actions. How much warning time you get, of course, depends on both the speed at which the system can produce that alert and how far away you are. The farther away you are, the more warning you get. And obviously, if you're far enough away, you don't care because the earthquake's too far away. So there's sort of a magic donut uh, where the earthquake early warning makes the most sense. This makes so much sense that it's been done in lots of other countries. 
The Japanese began doing it in the 1960s to protect their bullet train. And after the devastating Kobe earthquake in 1995, they built it out for public use and went public in 2007. There is the most advanced system in the world. Um, the uh, Chinese are building regional-based systems, not one for the entire country. Um, the, uh, there's a system in place in Taiwan. And then there are some smaller systems in, as you can see, uh, Turkey and Romania, which are not public. Uh, so only the ones with the yellow uh, ovals are public. And I shouldn't have left out the, the Mexicans because they were actually online before the Japanese were. Uh, they went live in 1991. Without exception, these systems were motivated by large killer earthquakes that gave those societies the impetus to invest in earthquake early warning. It's our goal that USGS does not, or not USGS, the US does not follow that path, but we build our system before the big earthquake, not after the big earthquake. Uh, here's a mesmerizing uh, video, so if you, uh, if you go to sleep on this, uh, you may not hear what I'm saying, but the point of this <laughs> is that earthquakes are complex beasts. Uh, that video, by the way, is the uh, shakeout scenario, magnitude 7.8. It's running 12 times real time. But the thing to note is that it starts down near the Salton Sea and it ruptures the San Andreas for about 180 miles northwestward. And so you, we tend to think of where was the earthquake and we get a spot on the map. Big earthquakes are not a spot on the map. They are a length of fault. And you have to account for that if you are going to do earthquake early warning properly for large earthquakes. So big earthquakes on a point, they rupture uh, a large length of earthquake. In this particular case, it's a unilateral rupture only breaking in one direction. It could break in two directions. It could jump faults. It could light up a second fault. Earthquakes can be extremely complicated. Um, so we have to t account for all of that. And the system that we're building effectively tries to do scientific modeling of the earthquake in real time as it happens. The bad news, though, is that a big earthquake doesn't necessarily start out big. You can't tell how big it's going to be when it starts. You can't tell how big it is until it's over. Uh, it may stop. It may keep on running. And there's no way a priori, based on the signal you've seen so far, to figure out which is going to be the case. Also, the affected area is not just a simple circle or donut around the, uh, the fault. So look at the LA Basin in this uh, simulation. Notice this red tongue that comes out and lights up LA and Ventura basins. That's a result of basin amplification effects. And so that has to be taken into account too when you're determining, okay, who do I warn? Who's going to meet some kind of threshold for alerting? So it is uh, quite a complicated thing given the, uh, the geologic uh, amplification that can occur. I'm going to show you a simpler idea here. This is uh, a piece of software that we give to our what we call beta users. Uh, industry partners who are interested in exploring the possibilities of the early warning system. So we give them this piece of software which receives the alerts from the shake alert system. I don't think I've used that word before. That's what we call the, <laughs> the system at large is shake alert. Um, so here's that same uh, earthquake 7.8 starting down near the Salton Sea. Uh, the yellow circle is the P wave, the red circle is the S wave, and the red dot is the epicenter. But the earthquake ruptures uh, northeastward, or sorry, northwestward, as I said. Um, now, for the LA area, and this uh, simulation is a countdown timer and an estimate for that little blue house uh, in the LA area, you got 61 seconds, but it's far away. So it's not going to have much impact. The estimated shaking is light. But as the earthquake proceeds, more energy is released, more waves are coming from that fault as it ruptures. And 37 seconds before the S wave arrives, the estimate is now moderate shaking. But as the fault continues to grow towards us at the Blue House in LA, the estimate of shaking grows. And then finally, five seconds before the strongest shaking arrives, the estimate is jumped up to an estimate of very strong shaking. So again, this is to emphasize that it's not a, a trivial problem either for the scientists or for alerting because most alert processes are a single thing. There's going to be a hurricane. We're done. That's all you need to know in this area. Or there's going to be tornadoes. But in this case, we probably have to alert successively larger and larger areas as the earthquake grows. 
and that adds some complexity to the alerting problem. Back to sort of the nuts and bolts of what we've got. Uh, what we're running today is called the production prototype version 1.2 of the ShakeAlert system. You've heard some of these times before. We went live in California in 2016. Uh, we added the Pacific Northwest in April. And uh, we've now got a full West Coast prototype system. And that involves processing centers. I showed you those yellow stars earlier. Uh, we've laid the, the uh, West Coast on its side. The stars have turned orange. Um, and then the diagram with all the arrows and uh, boxes, that's just to, that's the shock and awe slide. This is a, a sophisticated uh, system that is built for redundance. Um, and so it's not economically viable to send the ground motion information from every sensor to every site. It's too much data to move. So each of the local processing centers processes the data for the sensors in its local regional area. But once they've scanned the real-time waveforms or time series, the ground motions, um, they produce what we call parameters uh, derived from that. And those parameters can be fully shared among all the sites. And so we've got uh, a very redundant system, and alerts will be, um, will be created and delivered even in the absence of any number of those, um, those processing centers. And we actually had an, uh, an example of that. There was a fire in one of the uh, processing centers, took that one down, and the system went forward with no, no hiccups at all. Uh, and then ultimately there are public facing servers. Those two are redundant and multiple uh, so that if you are receiving your alerts from uh, Southern California and for whatever reason you lose comm to that center, you just switch over to Northern California or to Seattle uh, in order to get your feed. Um, the stations uh, are shown again in the dots. Um, the state of California uh, we have slated uh, for about 740 stations. Oh, I'm sorry, let me make sure I match the dots here. Uh, and I'll, I'll do it upside down. Uh, we're planning for about 1,675 stations in the three states. Um, and of those, 1,115 are in California. And where are we today? That's the bullet up above. We've got about 740 stations contributing to the system today. Of those, about 549 are in California. If you do the quick math, that means that we're somewhere a, a little less than 50% built out. I hope that's the right math. Um, so what does an alert look like? What is the product that comes out? Uh, everybody expects, well, it's trivial, isn't it? It's easy. It, it just tells me duck, you know, G get down under the desk. But wh who does it tell that to? What area is involved? And we found, of course, that the message uh, is one thing, but the actual action to be taken is not our decision, uh, particularly for a company. Should they stop their, their pipeline flow? Should they uh, take some other action that will cost money to their business? That's obviously a business decision they need to make. And we need to give them enough information to make that decision, not just a yes-no kind of alert. So uh, the first dot there is the event source parameters. Uh, if a user is sophisticated enough to take the source information, um, begins as a point source but ultimately grows into a what we call finite fault, the fact that there's a line uh, as the fault grows, um, they can do their own calculation about what the effects might be at their location to their facilities using what are called ground motion prediction equations. Um, now, not everybody's that sophisticated. So the next product down is ground motion intensity maps, where we use our best ground motion prediction equations to make a map of what the expected impacts of that earthquake will be. And the, th the value that most folks are uh, familiar with are modified Mercalli intensities, but we could calculate that for expected acceleration or velocity or whatever makes engineering sense for an end user. But we can simplify that and simply set a threshold and say, okay, for MMI6, we're going to tell the public. 
we can put that boundary anywhere we want, but then we can draw a polygon describing that boundary, and that would be a much more simplified kind of alert product. And so you can see in these uh, mock-ups uh, various ways of drawing um, boundaries around the areas at different shaking levels. So alert polygons are what are really needed for public alerting. Um, we're talking, as I'll talk about in a minute, uh, to the cell carriers. Um, so CAP formatted, which is common alert protocol. It's an existing format for sending emergency information to the cell carriers. Um, we can send them a polygon and say, warn people within this polygon. They map their towers, the towers broadcast the alert, and they can then, uh, all users within um, those cells would get it on their phone. But I'll tell you in a minute why that's a problem. Uh, and then any other uh, products or formats uh, that uh, might be needed for specific users, we, we could also potentially generate. All right, so I alluded to some issues with phones. You all have a, a phone, probably a smartphone. You get amber alerts. You get severe weather alerts. And why not earthquake early warning alerts? Well, the problem is the mechanisms by which those other alerts come to you are too slow for earthquake early warning. They were designed without earthquake early warning in mind. And so they take tens of seconds to maybe even minutes. And you may have been in a room where you got an amber alert and some people get it. Oh yeah, we're all on Verizon. And then later the AT&T people get them. Uh, and it comes in at different times. And that is because there is no regulatory requirement on speed of delivery for these alerts through what is called wireless emergency alert. So that's a problem. Uh, but our intention is to send the alerts out through every available telecommunications technology. The Internet, of course, uh, it can be fast and high volume, but it's fragile and is likely to go down either because of physical damage or traffic after a big earthquake. Well, if we're really early warning, we should get the alerts out before the big earthquake, but what about the aftershocks? So we have to take that into account. Uh, what I was talking about before, the cell system is run by uh, FEMA's IPAWS, Integrated Public Alert and Warning System. Um, it's an aggregator. It takes those alerts and then redistributes them out through many means, uh, one of which is cell phones, WIA, Wireless Emergency Alert, is the cell phone um, technology for doing that. And we are working closely with the cell carriers uh, to develop uh, the necessary standards to be implemented in the cell industry to allow those very fast alerts. But the process for making that technological change within the cell system, we're told, will take three to seven years. So we're starting now. Um, over the top apps, why can't I just get a tweet? Same problem, volume. Uh, if you try to notify hundreds of thousands of people simultaneously, the technologies will slow down and somebody will get the alerts late. Um, Push notifications are the technology behind those over-the-top apps, same problems. Um, but another very promising technology is uh, radio and television broadcast. They're already there, there are already transmitters, and you can send digital data over those uh, airwaves in order to get the alerts to folks. Uh, the only thing you really need for that to be viable is a receiver. And so it has to be either received by a purpose-built device or perhaps a set-top box, but all that's technology stuff in industry, and they're going to have to have either a business case or some other reason, incentive, to do those technological changes. All right. And then the final slide is uh, sort of the bad news. What are some of the constraints uh, holding us back from doing earthquake early warning today? Uh, the most obvious is funding. Uh, but even with uh, adequate funding, we're having difficulty with staffing. Uh, government jobs are sometimes not attractive to IT tech uh, kinds of folks, um, so that can be a, a problem. Uh, and then, of course, we're in a, uh, currently in a federal hiring freeze, which is also a difficulty. Um, the, we sent up some waivers, uh, got permission to hire, but given the current federal budget that uh, suggests, or the, the current president's proposed budget that suggests it's zeroing out the earthquake program, uh, management is reluctant to hire uh, into those uh, perhaps gloomy uh, future forecasts of our budget. Uh, the earthquake physics are a constraint. I've already explained those. Um, sensor coverage, uh, 
we're not completely built out, as you well know. And in order to get built out, we're finding that it's, uh, there are many barriers in the way, not the least of which are, are getting access, permits, and environmental OKs to go into sites. Um, much of the land in California is uh, controlled by federal government, and there are very stringent uh, environmental requirements. Uh, we can't just go dig a hole in the ground. Uh, we've got to go through a big process, make sure we're not disturbing an Indian burial ground, for example. Uh, so there are, are real constraints there. Um, likewise, in telemetry, uh, we have to put infrastructure out in the field with all those same issues. Um, and the uh, plan that we have and that we have always done with our seismic networks is to have a diversity of paths back, to use many different technologies to get the data back to the processing centers. We're continuing to pursue that strategy, um, but it still does mean that we need uh, cooperators. We carry data over other people's comm systems, and we want to continue that model and need the help of the state to access some of the resources they have for telecom. Um, the detection and alert, that's a scientific problem of how you very rapidly detect an earthquake, decide reliably that it is a big earthquake uh, before you pull the trigger and send the alert out. Uh, so there's uh, work being done there, but no system will be perfect and there will be missed faults and, and late alerts in the system. And so that has to be part of the messaging and training forward to the people so that a false alert does not result in you know, loss of confidence in the system. Um, one of the closest analogs to that kind of thing, we think, is probably weather reports. Sometimes you're told it's going to rain and it doesn't. Well, people still know how to cope with that kind of information. Uh, actually, another good analogy is that, you know, you're not going to decide whether somebody cancels their picnic, right? You just tell them what the chance of the rain is, it's up to them to decide whether to cancel the picnic. So that's part of the training and education part, is to allow companies and people to make educated choices about what to do. Now, in the case of the very short time you have for earthquake early warning, we hope that it's just a knee-jerk response, drop, cover, and hold on. But again, for business, it's going to be a little more complex than that. Um, system testing, uh, we've got some challenges there. We'd like to fully test the system with every possible huge earthquake that could happen in California, except we haven't had that many. Uh, and so we don't have a historical record that we can run through. We do have a test suite. We've got over 100 earthquakes, noise glitches, problem, noise, all sorts of things that, uh, that we do run through the system to try and uh, test it as best we can. And we're also working on synthetics, although frankly the science to create synthetic ground motions uh, is not well enough advanced to, to do adequate testing. Uh, so that's a challenge. Mass notification, I've already talked about. Public response, training and education we've alluded to. That's actually a huge component to this and was not in the USGS's original technical implementation plan. Um, but we do now have uh, a joint committee on uh, communication, education, and training uh, that is working very actively, including social scientists, uh, to determine the best uh, way to educate people, the best way to uh, convey the uh, limitations and capabilities of the system and what they should do. And they've recently, uh, haven't quite finished, but they've got a report uh, that says what is the optimal sound to make uh, for a cell phone? What voice instructions should come from the cell phone? What text should pop up on the cell phone? Uh, so that's going to be science-based, not, not just ad hoc. Um, and then um, finally, the user implementations we've talked about, too, in the industrial sector. They're going to have to have the tools to uh, make informed decisions as a business, whether or not they uh, take an action or not. And one of the reasons that some of our earliest adopters are, are organizations like BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit, is that the cost of a derailed train is huge and the cost of a slowed down train is very small. So it's a very simple calculation for them to make. For other businesses, it's not quite so straightforward. All right. I think that's enough. Thank you for your attention, uh, and I don't know where we go from here. Okay, well, let me thank you guys very much. Good, uh, good jobs. Questions from the board for um, either of these presenters? Yeah, well, it's no excellent presentation. So my question is more about the, um, you mentioned an initial earthquake can kind of be uncontrolled or understood in terms of its path. Is that the same way aftershocks work, or are they more predictable? 
aftershocks are no more predictable one on one. They're they're statistically more predictable uh, because there we've seen many aftershock patterns, and we know approximately how aftershock uh, sequences behave. But we don't know that there will be, you know, for example, if there were a magnitude 7, uh, 7.8, there will undoubtedly be several magnitude 6 and greater aftershocks. But we would have no way of knowing a priori where those would be. And that's important because Tina mentioned the workforce. And, you know, after a catastrophic earthquake in California, we're going to, mutual aid is, is going to be very, very vital. And, and so the aftershock component with, Several workers up in bucket trucks and, and down in down in holes doing work, you know, across the utility industry is going to be critical. That's why I had I had interest in the in the aftershock component. Sure, yeah, and that's why we're worried about the internet as a delivery mechanism, uh, because we do realize that there will be actually more vulnerability after the big earthquake. Buildings will be weakened, crews will be out in the field, emergency responders will be crawling around in precariously, uh, you know, just. You know, um, damaged buildings, uh, so there's a lot of fragility that's introduced that wasn't there before. So what is the, the threshold in which somebody would receive a notification or the early warning system would be activated? Because mm -hmm. presumably the ground's sort of always moving, right? So at what point does it trigger the warning? Well, what you're asking is at what threshold would we make a public alert? Right. And the answer is it's to be determined. Okay. Uh, it's expert groups like this and others, that, including the social scientists, who will help us make that determination. Mm -hmm. and, and one way to think about it is that's just one audience, mm -hmm. and we will have to determine at what level we make a public alert uh, that will you know, light up everyone. But there will certainly be other users that will want different levels. Uh, that are more fragile or, or maybe more tolerant. We don't know. Um, and so we have to just recognize that we're tracking the earthquake, we're, we're characterizing what the effects will be, and then we'll basically have to customize alerts for various uses. Hopefully we do that better than the, the weather folks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but there really is a, I mean, there's an active discussion right now about do you only alert those people who are in the area that's likely to be damaged, or do you alert everybody who will feel it. Uh, and there are arguments on both sides. If you, if you alert everybody who will feel it, they start to say, oh, you know, you know this goes off when I have a little rinky-dink earthquake. I, know I don't have to take any action. Um, but the flip side of that is, I just felt an earthquake and the system didn't go off. It doesn't work. What's the problem? And so there, it's really psychology and social science that, that will ultimately allow us to set those thresholds. Um, we, we have fairly frequent Earthquakes have spiked 3.0. Is is that adequate for testing the system? I, I mean, these, these more common earthquakes we have fairly routinely. Right. The system uh, does detect those earthquakes, but big earthquakes are, are fundamentally different. And if uh, if you tune the system uh, in such a way that it, it does pick up those earthquakes, it may do a poorer job of of really getting the big ones. And uh, so that's why I was saying that, you know, one of our uh, constraints is the lack of uh, data sets that, that show what a really big earthquake does and the signal that comes from the really big earthquakes. So the, the system does a pretty decent job of picking up the little ones, um, but it's, that's not enough testing to give us confidence that it'll do the right thing on the big one. Thanks. Um, you mentioned that um, it would be about seven years, I think, before the um, cell phone industry had the technology to be able to do the alerts, or maybe I misheard that. I was wondering if places like Japan, that I know they do the broadcasting over TV, if there's other kinds of public alerting there, mm -hmm. and if the technology exists someplace, or if we're, re if we're just creating it from scratch. Um, we, we are not. Uh, and in fact, the direction we're headed with the cell carriers in the U.S. is to adopt uh, the 3GPP TS 268.22 standard. Is that impressive? It's probably wrong. I probably got that wrong. But uh, anyway, there, there, there is an existing uh, international standard for rapid notification. Uh, and it's actually called the ETWS, the Earthquake and Tsunami Warning System. And that's what was implemented by the Japanese. 
and that's what is the uh, the current uh, uh, standard on the table in these discussions with the cell carriers. So we're not invent inventing it from scratch. We're basically adopting an existing standard, customizing it for the U.S. But even that is going to have that three to five year timeline, maybe seven. And then what we're doing is we've been meeting. You know, there's a number of initiatives simultaneously going on. Obviously. Um, one being FirstNet, which is this broadbanding initiative where there's spectrum specifically designated for public safety communications. And and, um, uh, uh, and we've been working with the carriers um, through that process and others. We believe that that, that pace can be accelerated. Um, um, and we're looking at a, a multitude, as, as Doug mentioned, of ways to move the signal, everything from satellite to microwave to to internet, um, uh, but but ultimately these you know everybody has this generally, um, and you know what in ten years or fifteen years or whatever maybe maybe these will all be sensed. I mean who knows how it's going to go with regards to that. But in in recent meetings with um, some of the executives of the of the providers, um, I, I think they've got more capability necessarily that they're necessarily willing to roll out quite yet. Um, they're doing some testing, but I'm hoping to shrink that time frame from five years to maybe, you know, sooner mm -hmm. rather than, than later. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. But it's a, there's a lot of dynamics that are going on there. And I, I must say that, you know, uh, Doug's examples and presentation show that, I mean, you have a whole, I think we all have a better appreciation when you just say, hey, earthquake warning, all that goes into an earth earthquake warning. It's not as simple as just sending out a warning. There's just so many different pieces to that, uh, which makes it a, a, a challenge in many ways. I actually had a second question sure. too. Um, so I'm really interested in the whole public response component of this. Mm -hmm. And I saw in the proposed budget or the budget of the $10 million in this early stages, it's a tiny amount mm -hmm. for that. So I'd be very interested to see what your committee came up with in terms of um, the criteria you said that of, you know, what the sound would be like and how the messaging would be because I know just in terms of getting our residents and visitors to San Francisco to be aware of preparedness in general, to make them, um, uh, to prepare them to be resilient, which we certainly want them to do, um, and to get them to even view um, what steps they need to take because we're not going to be there for the first 72 hours or 148 hours or whatever in terms of response. So, again, I just have a real interest in that area. And so any research that you've done from a scientific perspective, if that could be shared with the advisory group, that would be great. And I hope that as we move forward, we have time to talk about what that looks like in mm -hmm. terms of messaging. Yeah, so I'm going to turn around and find Kate. <laughs> So uh, she's the one who's uh, she, uh, she's one of the principal people on that group, and she knows you know what work they've been doing, and she works for Cal OES. Mm -hmm. So, I and I think Rain's going to cover some of uh, that too. Yeah. Uh, the, we were asked it to turn around very quickly for Ada's standards for cell phone carriers because there is this long timeline for them to get the standards into the hardware that would go on the backbone of the next generation of phones, and then we ought to buy new phones. So we had to come up with some very simple answers very quickly. There were also quite a few constraints that the social science would prefer is not there in terms of what makes a warning that people are likely to take up. And right now, what the cell phone carriers are offering us is a much more blunt instrument. But this is like a phase one. As time goes on, we hope to be able to improve it. So the committee, with the help of some social scientists on the community, came up with what are uh, to a large extent, our best uh, our best practice uh, ideas about what the message should be initially, what's going to be hard baked into this first generation. Uh, we have uh, it, it, we would like to see testing done of this initial message. We also, as a group, including the social scientists, believe that a bi level message is ultimately a good idea to test, where we would have two levels of messages. One said weak shaking coming, be aware, and then another that says strong shaking coming, take action. Not, not the exact words, but the idea that you could use uh, 
if, if you were on the outskirts and not having strong shaking, or if it's a smaller earthquake, it would give people a chance to, to experience the system. Because for people in uh, organizations, for people in schools, they're going to have a chance to drill and train, which the social science says is extremely important for uptake of warning. For the person who uh, th their, their phone goes off and they have never uh, really looked at early warning before, their tendency is going to be to do social milling and go, well, wonder what this is. Let's seek more information and, rather than take action. So initially, getting people used to the system uh, and trained and drilled in, in environments we do have control over is going to be very important to uptake. Uh, and we have, a, right now, Cal OES is undertaking a literature review and gap analysis of where the social science hasn't looked at certain questions we're going to need answers. But this initial standard we're giving to ADIS is, is based on our, uh, our experience and best practice uh, and a very small amount of research that was done by the USGS on earthquake early warning messaging. But a lot of it extrapolates from other larger warning message, you know, from earthquake and hurricane and so forth. Um, but it's, uh, you know, we're engaged right now and in, in the next few months we'll complete this initial literature review and gap analysis of the kinds of social science that still needs to be pursued. Thanks. David. Yeah, I just want to ask a question about the cell service. I mean, uh, another component of the cell service, we work a lot in rural areas. There's still large numbers of the state that don't have cell service. Yeah, absolutely. And so I don't know if they're, they might want a gap analysis of where we have no cell service overlaid with, you know, uh, earthquake zones overlaid with important infrastructure uh, that might be at risk or and other things. Yeah, it's a great, great point. And, and in fact, exactly what we're doing with this FirstNet initiative and, and – um, uh, statewide, because um, under FirstNet, the idea is, is that you're going to have um, a pro provider. This is a, a U.S. Department of Commerce initiative. Um, AT&T was um, was uh, awarded the nationwide contract for um, this FirstNet initiative. Um, and and the fact of the matter is, while AT&T has a lot of area, they do, they don't have all of the area. And, and you're right, we have. In fact, not just withstanding you know cell service, we're still up on dial-up service in parts of the, of California. So. Um, broadbanding is a whole another factor that we need to take into consideration, and um, and, I, and I think that really one of the one of the the, the ideas and uh, for the uh, uh, the um, the committee to consider as we move forward is is sort of prior helping to to prioritize maybe where we're going to maybe do these uh, test beds or roll out the system. Um, Probably not realistic to think that we will have a statewide rollout at the same time. We have probably regional rollouts, and we'll be able to give um, um, the operators the opportunity to test these in some markets, and then we'll we'll work to win those markets. Uh, but you know, there's the business side. You know, you, we're talking about what does an individual do when they get it? What do we want a business to do? Do we want um, you know? Uh, Barry and I have talked about this in the past. Um, you know, um, automated shutoffs to gas pipelines on some level or automated interruption to power distribution centers to minimize loss and minimize the amount of time power is out uh, to a community. So there's a lot of different things uh, uh, for, for consideration in the process. Great. Any other questions from, from the panel for this, these guys? Excellent. Thank you, guys. Um, let me also state for the audience, too, we will have a period of, I think you may have mentioned, but I'll just reiterate, public comment uh, at the end where people can come up. So if you have questions or thoughts, keep writing them down, and we'll, we'll get back with you. Um, okay, next up, um, I'd like to have uh, Ryan Arba, who is uh, with OES and is uh, our earthquake program manager, and he's going to come up and talk about uh, finance and, and um, some of the, the issues we've been working on there. So, Ryan. Thank you, uh, Director Gillarducci. Again, my name is Ryan Arba. I'm the branch chief for the Cal OES Earthquake and Tsunami Program. Um, and I'm here, uh, at least my specific portion of the presentation today is to uh, demonstrate how we are spending the $10 million, which was budgeted to us through the um, state budgeting process for this year. So we'll be showing it in the context of our functional areas. And I won't go into too much detail because Tina Curry covered this earlier today. But we have our four functional areas, the system operations, which is the nuts and bolts, research and development, it's our uh, mechanism we have for developing standards and also innovating the system and continuing to improve it over time. Uh, in the legislation, it's known as education and training. 
Uh, however, linking up with our federal partners and other states, it's uh, also known as communication, education, training, and outreach. Um, so there's a few other components that we include in there. And then finally, uh, finance, um, which is something that we're, you know, definitely involved in for um, now and into the future. So you, you've seen different, uh, you've seen a few versions of this map. This is the one uh, where, um, it, as part of our budget proposal this year, we've allocated six and a half million dollars to invest in these sensors. Now there's other components to it. It's not just buying the hardware. It's not just buying the sensor. You have to get access to the land. Um, you have to um, sometimes, you know, that could be on state land. It could be on other government lands. It could be on private land. Um, but you have to then pay to install it, and you have to make sure it's hooked up and contributing to the system. Um, so uh, with that, I wanted to show a, uh, an image of what one of these sensors would look like. Now we have uh, our scientific colleagues are here today if there are any specific questions, if we want to get into more of the details um, on this. But uh, since this is such a significant portion of what we were budgeted and what we're um, funding this year, I wanted to make sure that this board was aware um, of this component. So the picture on the left uh, shows what it looks like from above ground. Uh, my team and I had the uh, opportunity a few months ago to be able to go out and see one of these sites as they were uh, being installed. Just so you have a picture in your mind, this is about a 20 by 30 foot footprint. However, the two components are somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, three foot by three foot. They're spaced apart from each other in order to uh, allow the electricity unit not to conflict with the seismic um, sensor. Um, and uh, so you're aware, as we've mentioned our partners earlier today, um, California is funding uh, four different institutions through this um, in order to install 183, um, install and upgrade 183 sensors. Um, our state partners, the California Geologic Survey, UC Berkeley, uh, the U.S. Geologic Survey and Caltech are all going to be um, contributing over the next two years to help uh, make this contribution for the build-out. So uh, Doug went into this in great detail, so I won't, um, I won't, um, <laughs> uh, yes, in fact, we, the cell phone, it's um, alert has certainly been something that's been, uh, you know, all the, all the possibilities that we're trying to speed up with them greatly. But, um, but what I want to talk about is two ways that we're looking through our research and development functional work area to innovate in, in helping make these more delivery mechanisms available as well as making the system as reliable as possible. So the first one is our data cast pilot. And what this is is we're, um, we've created a partnership with the California Public Television stations. We've selected five stations for this initial pilot. And the idea is to use the additional bandwidth that, is, uh, that was left over when we converted from analog television to digital television. So a real easy way to say this is instead of sending it uh, over the internet, there's a chance that we can use that, um, that TV signal. So if you had an antenna on your house to receive your TV, we could also set out receivers uh, in order to receive the signal. Our hope with that is um, that there will be greater control and again allow for a more reliable signal in some areas of the state. Uh, this, we, while it could be used for the general public, we're even exploring a way to uh, have it so that you may have an application on your phone on Wi-Fi, could be able to receive this data casting signal um, while uh, um, something in the interim while we're working with the cell carriers to be able to deliver it to the public, but um, also potentially some of the industrial users may be able to really leverage this um, in the meantime. And this, um, through... Um, uh, and again, because they, uh, PBS has a public mission, the, there's no cost to the state at this point to be able to use this mechanism. So it's a very, very small dollar amount in order to, what we're hoping as a potential for a very high impact. And this is just a little bit about the different stations in California and where their coverage is. So I know you mentioned the rural areas. That's one thing where this, this may not be able to serve that population. However, we think it might uh, be able to have an impact in some of the urban areas and then you know, in the North Coast where there's a significant, um, uh, significant earthquake risk. We also have our state microwave network. Um, our state microwave backbone is a, is a system that Cal OES uh, has overall governance for um, that is generally used through the public safety 
um, public safety uh, group, uh, so your first responders, to communicate over radio and for various, many other, um, many other means for using the system. So today the seismic stations communicate to the central processor um, through cell modems and through, you know, in some remote cases and landlines as, as we've learned and, and such. So what we're looking is uh, hopefully both in the southern part of the state and in the northern part of the state, connecting up to a half dozen seismic instruments, sending the signal from the seismic instruments over our state microwave network and down to the seismological lab where the data can then be processed and then generated into a signal. If these two proof cases um, are able to um, prove to be successful, we then have a greater hope that as the program evolves over time, that all of the sensors that can hit a microwave uh, line of sight could then be able to hop onto the system and be able to deliver the, um, the signal to the, um, to the central processing units in order to be processed. So again, just one more way that we can make this system more reliable um, and really improve our redundancy. Um, in the future. So another component of our program and our charge uh, for, the, um, for what we were budgeted this year is the communication, education, training, and outreach. Uh, our big goal with the funding we received, a little shy of two and a half million for this, uh, is to use it for public service announcements. And we're working with the California Broadcasters Association, uh, which has the um, uh, opportunity to produce these uh, PSAs at a discounted rate, um, so you get a three to one return for um, you know it's compared to going on a um, through the to the broadcasters directly ourselves, and and again you know we'll be developing what these PSAs would look like, and um, you know again with our partners and with our different uh, community members, and that's something that we'll be definitely keeping you briefed on over time. Community engagement is also very important something that uh, our staff at Cal OES will be doing as we look at what our uh, rollout options are. Over time, we'll be wanting to work with the community leaders in order to determine where those, uh, um, how to best engage with your um, communities uh, and, um, and learn, especially how we can best leverage the system for the public. So the business plan, uh, we, uh, again, per our legislation, we have a report due to the legislature in February of 2018 uh, the components include uh, four parts. We have a cost analysis and proposed funding options, program roles, and an expect an expected program schedule, and finally a risk analysis. And uh, director, if I may, for a minute, we have uh, um, our blue sky contractors. Mm -hmm. So I just wanted to make sure he was invited up. He's still here. Okay, great. We are uh, fortunate enough to have Tim Gage, our former um, state of California finance director, who will be working with us on this program. So he'll come up and just give a. a Quick update on what his uh, program is doing. Great, thanks, Ryan. Uh, hello, all of the uh, members of the advisory committee. Uh, I'm Tim Gage with the uh, Blue Sky Consulting Group. Uh, my colleague Katrina Connolly is here with me today as well. Um, we're uh, getting started on this uh, process and uh, looking forward to working with Cal OES, all of its partners and all of you in terms of advancing the uh, business plan for the rollout of the uh, earthquake emergency alert system. Uh, as you can tell from the discussion here today, a lot of moving parts, a lot of pieces in motion, and so we're in the process of getting our arms around that so that then we can map out for the legislature and the broader public uh, what the picture should look like hopefully going forward. You know, one of the key components, obviously, has been mentioned several times, and that is funding. So one of the things that we'll be particularly focused on is what's an appropriate approach uh, in terms of funding. Some of that's already been developed uh, to a limited extent, uh, so we hope to build on that. Um, but one of the things, just to give you a sense of what's a little bit tricky about it, is this question uh, that uh, Tina raised earlier about the results of the benefit study where the idea is that this is intended to be, uh, in effect, a public good, not something that's limited uh, in by way of access by subscription, uh, and yet that can potentially create some complications in terms of what funding structure would be appropriate. So that's one of the things that we'll be looking at closely. So I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions, but I look forward to working with your uh, representatives or staff in the future. And uh, there you go.
Thank you, Tim. Thanks, Tim. You bet. Yeah. All right. Okay, just one, one more um, slide for the group. So the near-term considerations we're looking at, of course, the sensor build-out, very um, high priority, something uh, that is uh, very measurable and something we built into our contracts, too, where we broke it in into um, quarterly, quarterly goals so we can continue to make sure that we're keeping pace with the expectations of the, the legislation in this group. Uh, the deployment schedule, again, um, our director, uh, hit upon it earlier, but the we have to, um, you know, we have an opportunity in front of us to decide what the best uh, timing is for that rollout and what's the most reasonable and most appropriate. Financing strategy is, of course, um, appropriate, and then uh, the development um, and the review of our technology standards. So one area where the U.S. Geologic Survey has several pilot users that are um, starting to implement some of those. Uh, end user products, and we think there are many, many more ways where um, uh, we'll find that people will find real benefit from this system. And so we want to make sure that we're engaging those communities, empowering them to um, to leverage this, and uh, we'll be ready to scale um, the solutions that they find as we um, as we move toward our final rollout. And I, and th I think that. Um for example, one area we've uh, contemplated, uh, given um, all of the state lands, state infrastructure, university infrastructure, local government infrastructure, utility partners infrastructure, that there is um, opportunities to accelerate the pace at which we put sensors in the ground in areas that are already under our direct um, control, respectively. Um, and um, working on ways to um, um, get more flexibility and maybe a regulatory oversight, things like CEQA, et cetera, that, um, you know, may be necessary, but we could maybe look to find some relief for those areas. The other thing is working on streamlining any um, extra costs that may be associated uh, by using state lands um, or our partners at the university system or even local government, et cetera, that um, uh, this for the public good and because of the urgency of the need of putting them in the ground is something that, you know, we as state, as the state family would move forward or working with our local counterparts to move forward with um, rapidly. So there's a couple of, of areas that we as the the committee can consider as as we move forward with regards to discussions from the um, operation of the research and development group and or certainly in, the, in financing. We obviously want to make a dollar stretch and um, our ability to uh, leverage as much of of that or clear any bureaucracy uh, and save that will save dollars to be able to actually take the dollars we do have available and put them into uh, operation of this system is is critical. In addition, you know, we are looking at uh, different grants and opportunities. Um, federal lands is a little bit more difficult. You have a, a, a NEPA requirement usually, and you um, uh, sometimes federal grant dollars are not uh, that we could possibly obtain. Hazard mitigation or other kinds of uh, efforts are limited with regards to use in a, in a federal setting. So, again, it's a, it's a partnership across the board with everyone in, in this whole um, effort and it's really public private and non-governmental really coming together as far as the as far as the whole approach any other questions for uh, for Ryan on the business plan great Ryan thank you very much so um, it brings us to this issue of, of kind of the vision um, I think Tina you want to come back up and uh, we'll ask you to come back up and talk a little bit about that, um, and um, and then maybe I'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges. So, okay. go ahead. Well, just um, you know, I want to pay attention to the time, and and um, we have just maybe have a short period here where we um, dialogue a little bit and get a chance for to hear some of your input about the vision for this board. Our legislative charge was pretty straightforward. Basically, you know, the the the, mo the most recent bill. 438 recognize that this is important for California. I think we all um, can see see what a critical initiative this is, and also recognizes that it it's complexity, and that complexity calls for a governance structure to make sure that we are making all the right decisions in the right order and getting the right consult in order to 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 make you know 
carry this out for Californians, but also, you know, California, I don't think I have to um, remind this group, has long, you know, seen ourselves as a leader, and um, we know this is a national initiative. We, it will, I guarantee you that it will be here first in the, in the nation. I don't, I don't, and so we know that what we do here will be replicated, and others are looking toward, um, towards us for um, how to do this, and, um, and I think that's why the partnership with the USGS and their mission to have a West Coast system is, is so compatible, because we have that greater responsibility, um, um, first and foremost to Californians, but also by extension to, to others, and that's very consistent with um, the leadership we've had in, in so many other areas in emergency services and, and beyond. Um, so your advice is is critical to this to this process, and your um, you were selected um, from the different sectors that you represent because those are the the components that are going to be so instrumental for us to understand, so that we can um, we can we can implement this program the right way. So beyond that, um, you know we have to you know talk about with the details of that. You know what do you need um, to um, be able to conduct that advice? We want to be pointed and uh, very directed um, with your time and, um, you know, make sure to organize this large amount of information we've given to you and what's been done so far in a way that we can move forward rapidly and, um, and in, in a priority order that addresses the things that need to be addressed first, second, third, and, and um, at the same time kind of building all of this um, complicated structure together. Um, so with that, there's some materials that were in the, the, that we sent you ahead of time that captures what Ryan went over, which are some of the near-term considerations, obviously getting the, um, getting the um, projects done that the, that the state funding has directed us to do. It, it, um, hopefully that makes sense that we would need the sensor network first and foremost. There's some complications with that in terms of um, doing something on the scale of this. Um, we've Obviously, there's history of building a sensor network. I don't believe that it's ever been done, you know, this big, um, this quickly. Um, and so that requires, you know, some broad actions to facilitate that um, so that we can so we can get it done in a timely fashion. And um, certainly the other things we've talked to you about, which are near term. But then there's some stuff that are on the horizon very quickly. So page seven just kind of lays out some what we call considerations and, and an order for those, not necessarily prioritized within each segment, but we, we want to start working on all of these or keeping in mind um, as a goal, all Californians will have earthquake early warning. How do we um, start laying out a roadmap to get there in a in a in a in a way that um, that that makes the most sense? So I would just then kind of maybe um, put it, um, t turn back to the director on some thoughts he has on on your vision for this. Well, board. let me let me thanks Tina. Let me just um, kind of reiterate uh, as a background for everyone. Um, so historically. Um, there's been a funding stream to sustain what we call, and, and, and Doug Gibbon had mentioned it, the, the California Integrated Seismic Network. This has been a funding stream. The USGS contributes to that on the federal level with some of their federal funding, and, and, and we as a state through OES contribute uh, to that, and that's money to keep the sensor, uh, the, the network sort of operational. Um, uh, the earthquake early warning is sort of the build out from that. It's the next level up and um, requires a lot of focused um, financing to uh, support that. There's been uh, a lot of sort of review of what Tim and his team are doing now in the, in the, in the business plan and looking at the financing is to sort of um, confirm the, the projected numbers that have been um, uh, sort of professed by the various worker, working groups, something we're in the, in the neighborhood of, of 28, 30 million to get the whole system fully where we need to. That's building out the rest of the 50% of the network and um, um, doing all the things that we've just talked about for the last um, hour or so, uh, and roughly around 15 uh, million or so uh, uh, annually uh, to keep the system operational sensors up to date and continued R&D and uh, making sure that we have enough staffing across the board. Um, uh, Doug mentioned a number of things and challenges with regards to staffing and, and other kinds of um, challenges. Uh, we certainly are also looking at, uh, from our role as the state's Homeland Security Agency, uh, the concerns of cybersecurity as we roll this system out and ensuring that whatever does get uh, implemented is, is, a, is a system that is as redundant as, or as um, 
as uh, uh, capable as possible against any potential uh, cyber attack. Um, and so uh, all of those are factors and standards that need to be built into uh, the system. We're working closely with the, um, with the uh, telecom industry on that particular point as well. Um, so um, when we look at the, the near-term considerations and, and, um, and we consider that, that the $10 million that was uh, initially invested by was state dollars uh, to really accelerate that portion of the state of California system, uh, in the past uh, year and a half or two years, I think there's been about, I'm going to say something, correct me if I'm wrong, Doug, something like 16, uh, 10, 10 to 16 million dollars uh, uh, of federal dollars that were pumped in um, uh, congressional appropriations. Uh, these are all been great to accelerate um, a lot of the f um, federal dollars supporting the state system, but also to build out the, uh, the Pacific Northwest and Oregon and, and Washington. Um, we, I think, certainly are very, very supportive and want to do whatever we can to ensure that our, our partners at USGS continue to be funded appropriately and, um, and, and hope that the uh, uh, President's proposed budget, uh, that the Congress, Congressional Oversight will come in and, and, uh, and refresh the, that funding. Uh, but in absence of that, we still have an obligation to get our California system operational. Um, and so um, while the, the, the governor appropriated the $10 million initially, um, uh, one of the challenges that we will move forward in is to uh, look um, through public-private partnerships and other kinds of funding uh, mechanisms to ensure that, that this system uh, gets the funding it needs to be fully operational. Um, so we're, you know, there's a, there's a you know, as, as the group's working on a plan that will be brought back to the um, to the advisory board uh, on maybe a, uh, several uh, potential uh, ways to be able to do that moving forward. But as, as Tim said, um, being for the public good across the board, how best are we going to be able to do that? And we want to take into consideration um, all the various uh, statutory requirements that, that may come into play in that as well. So it's, it's a complicated system. Um, that said, we're, we're trying to maximize the money and the effort. Uh, that is made available. And that near-term consideration in 2017, particularly addressing um, uh, the ability to accelerate the pace by which we could build out that other 50% um, with additional funding that we currently have and funding that may be immediately on the horizon, um, and um, have a good discussion about what areas of the state that we want to um, consider doing this limited rollout. You know, we've got beta projects on BART. Um, um, we have certain local governments, I know San Francisco and Los Angeles, and, um, and as at OES, we have some beta projects that we've been working on uh, the Shake Alert. Um, and, um, and so we may want to capitalize on those uh, as we build out um, the rollout. Urban areas obviously make a lot of sense initially, uh, but, you know, I think that um, we're going to want to focus on where the Earthquake threat is probably the, the most critical, um, and you know our urban centers certainly. I mean, all there's faults all over the state, but you know when you think about population density, um, industry base, etc., infrastructure, highway systems, etc., our big urban centers, um, um, surely the Bay Area region and and the Los Angeles basin are are certainly of great concern, uh, but not the only concern by any stretch of the imagination. So um, I guess I would ask um, uh, the board what maybe what you see at this point as to maybe um, or maybe what concerns you have or maybe ideas or uh, recommendations you may have to address some of the things, particularly in the, the near, near term considerations that were put forth. Any thoughts? Barry? Go first, Mark. Yeah. And I think um, Doug said it well. There's a lot of moving parts, <laughs> and you know, getting it, getting an understanding on what are the most like critical success factors early on, and and getting visibility into that. And and I, I think you mentioned it, Mark. I, I think the team is pulling together some of that, but I think we could be most effective uh, as a board in, in understanding. Hey, what are the short-term deliverables that 
that really make a difference in, in moving this forward and, and with the, in consideration of cost and, and speed. And um, uh, it's, if, if anything else, we, we can sleep on <laughs> what, what those are. And, and I think be uh, uh, come to the table with some creative alternatives from each of the areas we sit. Because um, because I, I think there's you mentioned um, uh, you know land and we, between all of us probably oh, cover <laughs> most of the state. Yeah, yeah uh, is interesting with the map up there showing where the sensor should go. It's very similar to the map of assets I have in distribution across the service territory of PG&E. <laughs> so it, it's a huh. I think there's a lot of commonality here. <laughs> Uh, but but I don't know if that is like is that a, is that a major obstacle or not? Uh, it, could, it could could be medium. Um, so yeah, not, you know, no one wants to jump up and say, "Oh yeah, we can do this, that, and the other thing." But but we want you to. Okay. <laughs> well, <laughs> well I, I see that uh, Cal State Fullerton uh, is is part of the one of the um, campuses that is dealing with that research, the the tone of this, mm -hmm. and and if you think about it. Most of the campuses are a small city, rec uh, a microcosm on that early exactly. warning, which we have, but the technology may have that lag. But we're kind of a market for that. Um, we also have a living lab concept where I would expect that uh, this would fall right into an academic program that would go hand in hand to test this out, set this up, before it gets rolled out to a broader general public. It seems to be... A, a positive there. You had mentioned the overlap of uh, locations. It doesn't have to be on flat land. It sounds like it could be on a hillside, unbuildable sites otherwise. I don't know how that map outlines with where our campuses and off-campus centers are, but that may, I think for all of us, be a possibility to consider. If it's a 20 by 30, there's a lot of flexibility and we've got a lot of hills. So, yeah. for what it's worth. Yeah, that's excellent. Um, let, me, let me just kind of reach out to Doug real quick. I know you're taking notes. I, I know you've got an idea where sensors need to be in place, but you just mentioned hills versus flat land, and there's a lot of a lot of science behind that, but there's still areas that could be considered in both those flat or on the hills. It's something. Yeah, you wouldn't necessarily exclude a, a, a sloping area. As I know, NEPA would still have to be done, whether it's a slope or a flat spot, and, and that's one of the major impediments yeah. to making progress. I should probably defer to the network operators sitting behind me. They, they know a lot more about this. Yeah. But I think maybe one of the things for the advisory board which could be beneficial is to maybe have um, the operators present to us some of the criteria that's required uh, for putting a sensor in the ground and some of the areas that would work um, to help build out that other 50%. And then we can overlay those with areas where um, we all have jurisdictional uh, lands. And, and, then, and then, you know, whether that they're saturated already or where we can build out further. Um, and then I think it would give the members of the, of the, the committee to, the ability to go back to their respective um, agencies and, and figure out how maybe best to make that work out. Because there could be, I think, the, certainly we are cognizant and, and aware of both CEQA and NEPA. Sometimes it applies in one, sometimes it doesn't apply in another, and so we want to work through those as well. So if, the, if that would be, a, I think, good deliverable. Any other thoughts, questions? I'm just curious, um, do we know in terms of the complete full public rollout what the dollar amount would be on that. I mean, we're talking this current year with 10 million, we're going to be able to install, I think I read 183 mm -hmm. new and or renovated mm -hmm. sites. If we're looking to 2,000 total, which I think I also read, we have a big gap to still go. On um, the way I see it, it's more than half that we still have to put in. So I'd love to have the um, what the director said, you know, the analysis of where those should go, and that would be really interesting. But I'd also like to know what ultimately, how much money do we need, and the, and also, how much money do you need annually then to actually make sure to maintain them? Right. 
Yeah, I appreciate that. And there's been some estimates, and um, the business plan um, is going to help us really kind of fine tune that final price tag, if you will, looking at all the elements, and um, and we'll we should be able to see some kind of early results of that analysis um, as its plans being developed. So we'll definitely be able to come back to you with that. Thank you. And I th I think that in the uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but um, the couple ways that we've tried to accelerate that and may may not be reflected appropriately in the numbers is many of the sensors that the California Geologic Surveys has have been sort of, would you say, David, repurposed to make them earthquake early warning, um, uh, uh, and you've also added new ones, but you've done kind of both, right? So, yeah. We've done both. So uh, there's a selection of them that we're adding additional sensors to those existing sensor sites, and then, of course, then there's a need for additional sensor sites. Okay, good. And then you guys have both the, all the operators have put some new ones in, but I I do think it's very important that we get a finite number of total number of ones that we need. That would be helpful as well. And the other thing is, is that there are, you know, there are the sensors in the ground. Like the uh, some of the utilities currently operate sensor arrays. It'd be good to know uh, uh, exactly what that where those are located and um, and and build out. Um, I'd also ask that um, maybe, you know, we've got some great, you know, the, the operators of the system, particularly UC Berkeley, at least in the state family. Uh, I know there's a lot of work being done in other University of California and even CSU uh, campuses on this and uh, leveraging that uh, and those uh, um, those efforts and building it into the research and development arm and, and broadening that, that uh, participation I think is really important, you know. I mean, today I think it was mentioned that the UC uh, San Diego is doing a bunch of shake table work, and they've got a lot of efforts going on down there that's pretty innovative. So it'd be great to engage them a little bit more in detail. Yeah. Um, yeah, I would agree. I think, um, you know, trying to, to convene all that, that research that's going on at the different institutions and pull it together would be, um, would be beneficial for um, probably for the board to hear what, what's been going on. Yeah. My big concern is that we struggle with trying to address maybe a topic area that has been mentioned, and there may be one of the universities that's already doing research in that area that we just don't know about. Why don't we take that, you know, do a, do a, do a scan and find out what's being done in the key areas, and we could, working back through you guys and your various respective um, uh, systems and, and kind of get a sense about how much work is being done in that area and then leverage work that may be already being done. Great. Um, yes, ma'am. So to echo that, and was really triggered by Doug's presentation as well as Secretary Podesta's comment about determining what our threshold is for when these public notices come out. I think it would be also helpful to get more background on what the existing practice is in terms of hospitals and facilities. Do we already notify, let's say, nursing homes if there's a specific magnitude? Um, I think that would help us get a better understanding in terms of baseline, how much more the shake alert beyond the beta version and now moving forward could actually afford us more protections, not just the time for someone to take action. Yeah, that's excellent. Very good. Any other items that you think as, as board members that you would like to see feedback on, um, and you'd mentioned a couple on some of the cells, uh, cell system, we can maybe be a little bit more, uh, get more information to the board members on that. Um, Barry? Yeah, uh, Mark, the uh, the work that was done for the, the benefits in the study, mm -hmm. is there an executive summary that... Yes. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, there's probably this. I'm not right. looking for that. <laughs> but is it, yeah. I think it'd be you know it'd be good to share that. Absolutely, we'll pull that piece off and, and um, make sure that you get that. And, and if there's interest, maybe we can have have someone come kind of de debrief us. Mm -hmm. around yeah, and that's on the implementation plan. The or benefit study. Oh, the benefit, the benefit study. study. Yeah. yeah, that was a fascinating mm -hmm. uh, work. It really was. And that was commissioned. Uh, um, Lori Johnson, I think. Uh, yeah, actually, the Seismic Safety Commission was a, a partner in um, with us in conducting that study, yeah. and it was done through UC Berkeley. Yeah, and, so uh, leveraging here. all the different yeah. uh, um, partners. Yeah, I, I know they're really so we're real out of the box thinking as opposed mm -hmm. to this the utility industry, for example. Mm -hmm. right. So, be Absolutely. Good. thank you. 
Before I go to public comment, any other thoughts or comments by the um, by the board? Okay, great. So, public comment. Anybody would like to come up or, or present um, ideas or thoughts or discussions that we may have had today? Come on up. Hi, Patrick. Introduce yourself, please. Uh, my name is Patrick Welch. I work for Senator Jerry Hill, and uh, just wanted to come up here and thank the director, his excellent staff, uh, for the work. We've worked with them for the past two or three years to set this up, as long as get the financing for it. Um, Director Gillarducci has always worked with a sense of urgency. Uh, we appreciate that. Uh, we look forward to the work that this body produces. It's very important, um, I think, to the senator. And I think the legislature, by passing you know several pieces of legislation and, and putting some funding out there, I think they've showed that too. We're concerned about what's happening at the federal level. Senator Hill is working with his colleagues and the Calford congressional delegation, one of which uh, chairs a very important subcommittee that has jurisdiction over USGS. So we will continue to work with them um, to hopefully push back on that funding cut that's proposed by the president. And um, Lastly, I just want to say that, you know, Senator Hill, again, really wants to see this move forward. So if there's anything that he can do to continue to be supportive of this effort, our door is open. Um, give us a call. Come knock. Come meet with us. We're, we're always there to, to be helpful. And with that, just want to thank you. Yeah. And back at you guys. It's been fantastic. And thanks the Senator very much for everything he's done. <laughs> thank you. Any other, um, anybody else? Quiet group today. Anyway, okay. Huh? <laughs> this is hot. All right. With that, then I think that um, you've had a lot to chew on here. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of thought. Um, again, very deeply appreciative of all of your time. Uh, this is really a, a project that takes a lot of embracing. So uh, now, you're, now you're all embraced. Uh, and a big hug, and um, uh, look forward to uh, to uh, working with you. We'll get all the information out to you. Uh, and I think that we're going to be meeting quarterly. I think initially, uh, because there's so much going on, that sense of urgency is important uh, that we want to keep that momentum going. <coughs> I want to thank the staff and everybody who put the, the meeting together today and for all the different agencies that have been working so, so hard on this. Uh, you're to be commended. And, um, uh, again, one team, one fight. Everybody keeps working at it. And thank you with that. So with that, I kind of have a motion to adjourn. So moved. Okay, it's a second. Okay. Um, all in favor? <coughs> Aye. 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 All right. Meetings adjourned. Thank you, everyone.